So thank you for joining everybody. I'm going to talk to you today about troubleshooting VA ECMO in the cardiac surgery ICU. Now this talk is a bit narrow focused. I'm not going to explore um, an overview of how ECMO plays in in the cardiac surgery world or in the ARDS world. This is a very focused talk on just troubleshooting specifically VA ECMO in the cardiac surgery population. I'll start off by talking about the options for VA ECMO cannulation in the cardiac surgery world. And then I'll go through some of the common scenarios that we'll face. And I'll go through leg ischemia, drainage insufficiency, membrane oxygenator failure, left ventricular distension, pulmonary edema, and differential oxygenation in this talk. And these tend to be common scenarios that we face with VA ECMO in the cardiac surgery ICU. So I'll start off with a case. We have a 51-year-old male weighing 75 kilograms with crescendo angina, goes to the cath lab, was found to have severe left main disease, 95%, occluded proximal RCA, 100%, severe LAD disease. So this gentleman really is hanging on to life with a thread. Uh, he arrests in the cath lab, is resuscitated successfully after five minutes of CPR, a balloon pump is inserted, he started on norepi and epi infusions, and an urgent CVT consult is um, is called for. And so this gentleman is obviously emergently taken to the OR for an emergency cabbage. Um, he arrests again on induction of anesthesia, CPR, epi. He has ROSC with a fragile blood pressure, crashes on bypass, undergoes a cabbage times three, uh, lead to LAD, vein graft to the circ, vein graft to the PDA. However, we're now unable to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass due to poor LV systolic function, despite a balloon pump uh, with one-to-one -one augmentation and high-dose inotropes. What are the options do we have? Uh, what, what options do we have for mechanical circulatory support? And so in this situation, we can do a medium-term LVET like a Centromag, specifically just for LV support in which case we would drain the left atrium and the return cannula would be back into the ascending aorta. Or we could do central VA ECMO, which tend to, tends to, you know, we, in that situation, most surgeons would gravitate towards that. And with central VA ECMO, we drain the right atrium directly and return into the ascending aorta. Now you have the option here of going with really high flows. You're very central in terms of the location of your cannula, and uh, your cannulation is atrioaortic in nature. The other uh, or last option that we have is peripheral VA ECMO, where we drain the IVC by the femoral vein, and we return to the femoral artery slash external iliac artery, and that uh, has its own advantages. And so that would be fem-fem cannulation. So uh, medium-term LVADs, like a Centromag, for example, they have the advantage of giving you up to six weeks of support, and they obviously avoid the exposure to the inflammatory effects of an oxygenator, but they do not give you any support whatsoever for the RV, and they do not support the lungs unless you add on an oxygenator to the Centromag circuit. The second option that we mentioned is central VA ECMO, which supports both the right ventricle and the lungs. And it tends to be somewhat straightforward in the setting as you're trying to come off pump because you say you use the same cardiopulmonary bypass cannulas that you use. Uh, you just uh, hook them up to the ECMO circuit and you may bring them out below the sternum to be able to close the chest. And it gives you more options for venting with an open chest. And you avoid obviously the femoral artery complications and the potential for differential hypoxia. There's disadvantages, significant disadvantages with the central ECMO setup is that you need to reopen the chest for decannulation. There's the potential for mediastinitis with a chest that remains open, the higher potential for bleeding, and a higher risk of strokes. Your return cannula is really pumping back right into the ascending aorta, so there's a greater degree of potential for embolization. Peripheral VA ECMO, on the other hand, um, has the advantages of supporting still the RV in the lungs, but you can have a closed chest no need to reopen, no need to wean, uh, no need to reopen for weaning and decannulation. And there has been data to show that peripheral VA ECMO is associated with better outcomes and more, lower mortality rates compared to central ECMO. 
Uh, on the other hand, with peripheral VA ECMO, you run into the complications of having uh, the femoral artery being compromised, leg ischemia, artery dissection, and obviously the potential for differential hypoxia. And so these are your options. In this situation, with a patient who has a groin that is occupied with a balloon pump already, likely most surgeons would put this patient on central VA ECMO uh, until things settle down. I will go through quickly uh, the peripheral cannulation setup because that gives us an idea or actually is important for us when it comes to the, the discussion of leg ischemia. Uh, so with peripheral cannulation, you cannulate the common femoral artery and the common femoral vein just below the inguinal ligament and just above their respective bifurcations. Now, an arterial cannula, usually uh, the arterial cannula is usually about 15 to 17 French. Uh, when higher flow is needed, example in septic patients, you may need bigger bore cannulas, 19 to 21 French. Um, larger cannulas are obviously associated with more vascular compromise, uh, like limb ischemia complications tend to be more common with larger size cannulas. Uh, the interim guidelines by ELSO published in 2021 uh, mention an opinion that it's best to insert uh, the arterial and venous cannulas in a separate uh, in separate limbs to reduce vascular complications and to facilitate decannulation so that when it comes time to decannulation, uh, you can decannulate one side at a time without the potential for forming a, a fistula between both sides, a big hematoma that can compromise uh, circulation. And so if feasible, the venous cannula ideally uh, would be placed in the right femoral vein because the right femoral vein is a more direct path to the IVC in the right atrium. The IVC tends to travel on the right side of the body. And so the right femoral vein would be a preferable site for venous cannulation for peripheral uh, VA ECMO. And this would be a textbook picture of somebody with peripheral uh, VA ECMO. And I say a textbook picture because in real life, it's usually not that clean. You see that the sheets here are all clean. There's not a drop of blood. Everything looks you know, very nice. You have a right-sided venous drainage cannula. As we said, the preferred side is the right femoral vein. And you have a left-sided uh, arterial return cannula. And you have a very nicely placed uh, distal perfusion cannula as well, which we'll talk about in a second. So, with peripheral cannulation, vascular access should be under ultrasound guidance. In this day and age, you really need to use ultrasound to locate where the vein is and where the artery is. After adequate anticoagulation, you advance the guide wire into the vessel. After a series of progressive dilatations, you're able to insert the cannula. In certain situations, if example, if you have a patient who's obese, who has tortuous anatomy or, or peripheral vascular disease, sometimes you need a stiff guide wire. Uh, to be able to cannulate peripherally. Now, uh, with peripheral cannulation, imaging is obviously uh, required. Uh, obviously, if we're in the CSRU or if we're in the OR, uh, we tend to use TE to confirm that our guide wire is uh, in the vein going up to the IVC. Uh, and um, if you're obviously in the cath lab, uh, then sometimes fluoroscopy is a better option. And um, you can use TE or you can use uh, TTE as well. So you can uh, see here in this uh, subcostal IVC view that the guide wire is going up, uh, up the IVC to the IVC right atrial junction. Now, finally, after it's all said and done and after the peripheral VA ECMO uh, cannulation setup is all uh, completed, you will need a standard chest X-ray and an abdominal X-ray uh, to confirm appropriate cannula position after you've placed uh, both the drainage and the return cannula. Now, there is an alternative approach to peripheral cannulation, and that would be uh, to go to the upper extremity. So when, when patients have peripheral vascular disease or have very difficult femoral arterial access, the return cannula can be placed in the subclavian or axillary artery, and the drainage cannula can be placed in the internal jugular uh, vein. And so this is an alternative uh, approach that can be used that has certain advantages. It avoids complications of the femoral artery site. Uh, you minimize the, the potential for differential oxygenation. 
And potentially you can even facilitate, facilitate mobilization in case of predicted long runs of VA ECMO, because obviously when you have cannula in the groin, patients are tied to bed, uh, whereas with this setup, you can actually mobilize the patient. So, um, so basically, uh, I'll move on to the basic troubleshooting here. Um, and I'll, the first case I'll talk about is a 43-year-old female who weighs 97 kilograms, uh, who presented with a massive PE, arrested, achieved sustained ROSC, was placed on peripheral VA ECMO, heparinized, and then underwent a catheter-directed thrombolysis. She has no palpable pulses right now, and her legs are her leg is cool on the side that has the arterial uh, return cannula. So what are our therapeutic options? So it's important to mention that in this day and age, um, putting in a distal perfusion cannula uh, should always, always be considered uh, when you're placing somebody on peripheral VA ECMO. And these distal perfusion cannulas obviously are in the opposite direction of the return cannula. So the return cannula is going up the femoral artery, the external iliac artery, common iliac artery, up to the uh, abdominal aorta, whereas the distal perfusion cannula is directed down the superficial femoral artery uh, to perfuse that limb. And it's usually placed under ultrasound guidance. The puncture point may be in the common femoral artery above the bifurcation, but then you direct it down the superficial femoral artery. And you may confirm that the guide wire is in the superficial femoral artery by ultrasound or fluoroscopy. Um, and then you can potentially even confirm flow in the popliteal artery by ultrasound or continuous uh, flow Doppler. Now, what does this afford? What does this help you with? When you put in a distal perfusion cannula, you reduce the incidence of lower extremity ischemia quite drastically. So without a distal perfusion cannula, the incidence of lower limb ex ex ischemia is about 7%. When you put in a distal perfusion cannula, the incidence of ischemia is about 0 to 3%. So it reduces the incidence quite drastically. And as you can see here, a distal perfusion cannula looks just like the cordis that you would put in the IJ, except that it's reinforced, like it has a coil uh, in the actual cordis itself uh, so that it does not collapse. If you remember the context or the, or the texture of a cordis, cordises tend to be a little bit more collapsible, whereas here the walls are a bit more reinforced so that they don't collapse on themselves. But they look just like a, an introducer sheath you would use for a uh, pacer or a pulmonary artery catheter. And here on ultrasound, ideally you'd want the guide wire to be directed down uh, into the superficial femoral uh, artery. Uh, and that's really what you want to perfuse distally uh, once you're on uh, peripheral VA ECMO. Now, uh, with small cannulas, uh, especially with larger size patients, sometimes distal perfusion cannulas may not be needed. However, decision making can be informed by using NEARS, by using near infrared spectros spectroscopy or tissue oximetry. And so the NEARS, putting a NEARS probe on your, uh, on your limb uh, should read on your lower extremity, it should read more than 50%, preferably more than 60%. Uh, now, if it drops below 50%, then definitely, uh, then you should consider put in, putting in a distal perfusion cannula. And the difference between the two extremities should be always uh, less than 20%. Uh, if, it's, if there's a difference between the two sides that's more than 20%, that indicates likely that you have some degree of compromise of perfusion to that side. And so in decision-making for putting in a distal perfusion cannula, you may use uh, a near's uh, tissue oximetry probe to decide whether there is a sufficient compromise of circulation to that limb. The, when do you insert a distal perfusion cannula? Ideally, uh, on ECMO institution, when you first put the patient on ECMO. However, there are studies that have looked at it as a salvage intervention that have showed that it's a very effective salvage intervention. If you put a patient on ECMO, you start developing uh, a cool extremity on that side with loss of pulses, you may consider putting it in as a salvage intervention. The other option, obviously, for ongoing 
ischemia uh, of the limb is to switch to a central VA ECMO and get rid of the cannulas and the groin altogether. However, this is very, very invasive. And I uh, generally, um, you know, given the complications of central VA ECMO and the outcome data that shows that peripheral is probably superior, uh, I would probably shy away from that option uh, if at all possible. So uh, let's move on. So we've discussed the configuration for cannulation for VA ECMO. We've discussed troubleshooting leg ischemia. Let's move on to a very common problem that we see in the ICU, and that is drainage insufficiency. So we've all seen this. We, the nurse comes to you, tells you there's shatter, there's chugging in the lines. Can we please give volume? Now, if you leave these now, I'll get to the volume part in a second, but if you leave the chatter progress and leave it unchecked without intervening, it may progress to flow fluctuations, and you may start be you may start to see hemolysis. The proper name, obviously, for line chatter or chugging is drainage insufficiency. And so what can cause drainage insufficiency? The causes include hypovolemia, especially when you're first inserting VA ECMO in a patient, they tend to lose a little bit of blood on the insertion, on draining the blood into the circuit. You may, you may face chatter on initial insertion because of a volume issue or a bleeding issue. And so if they're hypovolemic, administer volume and assure no bleeding. But there are other causes that can cause this. And I don't want us to gravitate to volume all the time when we are faced with chatter. And I'll get to this in a second. Uh, other causes of chatter or chugging include uh, high pump speeds. And so if you reduce your pump speed, you'll reduce the uh, the chatter or the drainage insufficiency. Uh, drainage cannula malposition or kinking can also give you drainage insufficiency. So you should always think uh, of checking your venous line position either on x-ray or on TE. But there are other causes of drainage insufficiency. Tension pneumothorax, tamponade, intra-abdominal hypertension, all of these will reduce venous return uh, and will cause chatter, will cause drainage insufficiency, in which case you need to treat the actual cause. Uh, vasoplegia, example with multi-organ failure, can sometimes lead to drainage insufficiency. And a small size cannula, an inadequate drainage cannula, can also uh, be the cause of drainage insufficiency, in which case placing a second drainage cannula may be the treatment of choice. And so this is a case that we had in CSRU that basically had chatter. And from the night before, the team had been giving volume. The patient's grossly positive, continued to have chatter. We checked the x-ray the next day. And what we saw was that the drainage cannula was actually kinked. And we did a TE at the time, and we confirmed that it was actually uh, kinked. And so it needed to be uh, repositioned and with TE guidance, uh, we straightened it out and just pulled it back essentially and things got better. We got rid of the drainage insufficiency. So why do I say try to think before giving volume? The reason I say that is that because excessive volume has been linked with worse outcomes. Uh, in this study where they examined the impact of fluid balance on the outcome of adult patients treated with ECMO, uh, they looked at 115 patients on VA ECMO and 57 patients on VV ECMO. And this was a retrospective observational study. And after adjusting for confounders, they found that positive fluid balance at day three post-insertion is an independent predictor of 90-day mortality. So as I said, on insertion, it's pretty common to be faced with volume issues, giving some volume on day one uh, or, or even up to day two of insertion of ECMO is fine. But once you reach day three, you should really be thinking of getting volume off. That perpetual chatter volume cycle will lead to definitely detrimental outcomes. It'll compromise their breathing. It can contribute to mortality. And so uh, that's why I say try to avoid that knee-jerk reflex of giving volume every time you see chatter. And this algorithm here is actually a very elegant uh, algorithm that describes what you really should be thinking when you see drainage insufficiency. So when you first see it, one quick fix for it is usually to reduce the pump speed until the blood flow is stable. Now, obviously you need to make sure that the patient is adequately supported uh, in terms of systemic blood and oxygen delivery. Once you reduce the pump speed, you're obviously reducing flow. 
Uh, and so you should make sure that their lactates remain well, that their urine output if, you know, remains good. And so you should really make sure that their systemic perfusion is not compromised when you reduce pump speed. Um, if the patient's not adequately supported, you may need to incrementally increase pump speed slowly. And then if you see a recurrence in drainage insufficiency, uh, look at things like agitation, bleeding, uh, reversible causes like attention pneumo, a cardiac tamponade, intra-abdominal hypertension, cannula clot, or malposition. So obviously a lot of these are bedside assessments in addition to x-ray and TE assessments. So really try to look for these causes um, and do an x-ray, you know, check where the cannulas are lying on TE, make sure you're not dealing with some of these reversible causes like attention pneumo, or cardiac tamponade, uh, or cannula clot or malposition. Once you've evaluated all this and ruled out all these reversible causes for drainage insufficiency, then you, then you can assess fluid responsiveness. And so see how in this algorithm, they brought down fluid responsiveness to item number three or four on their algorithm. Uh, and it's not the knee jerk sort of, you know, always give fluid to somebody with persistent uh, drainage insufficiency. They basically uh, encourage you to think through the possible causes and try to find an alternative explanation for it before you go to uh, giving volume. And even before giving volume, they would suggest assessing fluid responsiveness, uh, consider a Trendelenburg position. And if there is improvement in drainage insufficiency, then you can resuscitate at that point, give a little bit of volume, and that may help. If you still have persistent drainage insufficiency, then placing an additional drainage cannula may be uh, your, uh, maybe your, your only solution here. And so uh, this is what I would encourage you to go through when you're faced with chatter next time you're in the unit. Next, let's move on to membrane oxygenator failure. And uh, membrane oxygenators um, tend to not oxygenate as well over time. Decay, a decay in membrane oxygenator efficiency over time is commonly caused by clot formation in the membrane oxygenator. Most membrane oxygenators lifespan is anywhere from 15 to 21 days, after which you will not be getting good oxygenation uh, from that membrane oxygenator. Uh, now, membrane oxygenator thrombosis is, uh, is, is suggested usually by an increase in D-dimers if, you if you're monitoring D-dimers on a regular basis and a decrease in uh, fibrinogen, but there are other signs that your membrane oxygenator is starting to thrombose. And so if you start seeing a decrease post-membrane PO2, so if your perfusionist measures a blood gas, takes a blood gas post-membrane, and they start seeing a decline in the PO2 post-membrane, post-oxygenator membrane, uh, that decline indicates that you're starting to thrombose your membrane oxygenator, you're going to run into failure soon. Normally, your post-membrane PO2 is above 300 millimeters mercury. Another sign uh, of membrane oxygenator failure is an increase in the delta P. And what do I mean by the delta P? It means an increase in the pressure gradient pre and post oxygenator. So normal, some of the machines will have that capability of giving you pre-oxygenator pressure uh, now, that's obviously distal to the pump, but pre-oxygenator, uh, which we call P2. And then it also measures the pressure post-oxygenator, which is P3. And normally, the pressure pre-oxygenator uh, minus the pressure post-oxygenator, is the difference is less than 50 millimeters mercury. If you start seeing an increase in uh, the delta P, that means that you're, there's a significant drop in pressure pre- and post-oxygenator. Now that indicates that you're likely running, going to be running into membrane oxygenator failure. And so when do you replace the oxygenator? The oxygenator needs to be replaced when the po post-membrane PO2 is starting to go less than 200 millimeters mercury, or the PCO2 starting to go up more than 45, despite adequate sweep speeds that are um, equal to uh, the blood flow or more than uh, four times the blood flow ratio. And so, um, so the PO2 tends to be the one that we see most often, a, a gradual decline in the post-membrane PO2, 
and an increase in the delta P. If the delta P increase is greater than 100 millimeters mercury, that usually indicates that you need to replace the membrane oxygenator. So what is uh, P1? P1 is the drainage uh, pressure. So let's, let's go through um, what it looks like. So P1 uh, is uh, the minus 97 here. This is the venous drainage cannula pressure. Uh, usually it's anywhere from negative 50 to 100 uh, millimeters mercury. If it's anything more than negative 100, uh, and by that I mean, I guess, less than negative 100, like negative 110, negative 150, you'll start seeing chatter. So that is P1, that is the drainage pressure. And uh, as I said, normal negative 50 to negative 100. Now, uh, P2 is the pre oxygenator pressure. Uh, and the normal there is anywhere from 250 to 350 millimeters mercury. And then P3 is the post oxygenator pressure. And the normal there is about 200 to 300 millimeters uh, mercury. And the delta P, the difference between P2 and P3, is normally less than 50 millimeters mercury. A delta P greater than 100, as I said, indicates that you need to change out your oxygenator. And that should trigger uh, that process. Uh, and other setups have also um, a display of these. So this is another ECMO machine. <laughs> Excuse me. So here in this setup, we can see that um, the pre oxygenator pressure is 232 and the post oxygenator pressure is 197 and the pressure drop is only 35. So that is a reasonable pressure drop, uh, which would not be too concerning. So how do we monitor for membrane oxygenator failure? Number one, periodic inspection of the membrane oxygenator. You can see here that there's a dark clot on the angle of that membrane oxygenator. So you'll see that perfusionists will always turn their iPhone lights on, inspect the, um, the membrane oxygenator periodically. Uh, Post-membrane blood gas, as, as, we, as we mentioned, should be monitored, and we should also document the delta P. Now, monitoring these will save you uh, having to go, uh, like there have been studies that have looked at, you know, where you get uh, sudden membrane oxygenator failure and you, you really need to change the membrane oxygenator on an emergency basis. Most of these are because we fail to monitor um, that, uh, that we're, run, we're going to be running into oxygenator failure. And so uh, in this day and age, it's important to actually document and monitor these parameters so that you don't run into a situation where you're changing it out on an emergency basis. Now, uh, the treatment is obviously changing out the oxygenator, which is, you know, easily said than done. Uh, you need to be prepared to maximally support hemodynamics and respiration during that change out of the oxygenator. And you need to be really ready that, you know, you're going to be doing this in less than a minute because if the patient's totally dependent on VA ECMO, changing out the membrane oxygenator and clamping the circuit, you may run into a bratty arrest type of situation if you take too long to change, to change it out. But I mean, inexperienced hands, uh, changing out the oxygenator should be, you should be able to accomplish that in less than uh, a minute with obviously adequate perfusion and um, uh, cardiac surgery support. Let's move on to another situation where we will need to troubleshoot sometimes, and that is left ventricular distension or uh, pulmonary edema. So uh, we all know here that VA ECMO, peripheral VA ECMO, um, uh, will support your hemodynamics and will increase your mean arterial pressure. However, because you're pumping blood into the arterial system, peripheral VA ECMO does increase your afterload. And with increasing your afterload, it can potentially increase your left-sided filling pressures, your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, your left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And you can potentially lead to an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. And so these are all things that can happen with peripheral VA ECMO. On the other hand, impellas will also support your mean arterial pressure. Um, however, because they suck blood out of the LV, they will not 
increase your filling pressures in the LV. If anything, they will make your filling pressures actually drop because it's really like putting a straw down that LV, sucking blood from the LV out into the ascending aorta. So they'll actually drop your LV EDP and reduce your myocardial oxygen demand. Balloon pumps, as we know, will also increase your mean arterial pressure, but they will reduce your afterload. When the balloon deflates, that vacuum effect leads to a reduction in afterload and leads to a reduction in LV EDP and a reduction in myocardial oxygen demand. And so you can see here that there is a, a bit of um, a detrimental effect from peripheral VA ECMO, uh, potentially uh, on afterload and myocardial oxygen demand that could be countered with an impella or a balloon pump. And that is what led to this study here, which was published in 2020. And when it first came out, we, you know, everybody was talking about it. Uh, this study examined left ventricular unloading uh, in patients who had both uh, an impella plus VA ECMO. Uh, these, this was a population with cardiogenic shock, and they compared that combination of LV unloading with an impella plus the support of VA ECMO uh, to st the standard VA ECMO on its own. And so they compared that uh, in this retrospective cohort propensity matched study and what they saw was that the 30-day mortality was lower with the combination of ECMO plus Impella. And they called the combination of ECMO plus Impella, they called it ECMELA uh, in that article. And they demonstrated that mortality was actually lower when you decompress the LV using the Impella uh, combined with peripheral VA ECMO. And you can see here the probability of death uh, with uh, VA ECMO on its own was higher than the ECMELA arm, which had Impella plus VA ECMO. However, they did show that uh, having that combination of Impella plus ECMO was associated with more severe bleeding, access site-related ischemia complications, abdominal compartment syndrome, renal replacement therapy. All of that was actually a little higher with the ECMELA group compared to ECMO alone. Uh, but still, the mortality benefit came out in favor of ICMELO. Now, there's a so there's another systematic review that was done, and there's actually other studies that have been done since. Um, none of these are RCTs, but uh, lots of study, lots of retrospective matched studies that have looked at this. Uh, and in this meta-analysis, they looked at the combination of VA ECMO plus Impella uh, versus the combination of VA ECMO plus a balloon pump. As I said, they, they can you can counter that increased afterload either with an impella or the or with a balloon pump. And they called the combination of VA ECMO plus impella ECPELA. So they changed the name around a bit from ECMELA to ECPELA. And what they demonstrated was that there was similar short-term mortality, uh, whether you uh, unload the LV with an impella versus a balloon pump, the mortality was similar. And there was no difference in rates of renal replacement therapy, limb ischemia, or stroke. However, the ECPELA arm uh, was associated with more major bleeding uh, and hemolysis, uh, which you would expect. Now, um, is this really a problem? Should we monitor for LV distension? Yes, we definitely should. Um, and the monitors that we should use to assess for LV distension include the arterial pulse pressure. If you have a flat line like this, that tells you that the LV may not be pumping forward a whole lot and the LV may start, you know, was likely starting to get distended. Ideally, you want the pulse pressure to be less than 10 or more than uh, 10 to 15 millimeters mercury. And that indicates that the LV is ejecting somewhat. Uh, you can look at uh, monitor SCVO2, CVP, uh, look at chest x-rays for signs of pulmonary edema with LV distension. Uh, monitor with echocardiography, which I would say is extremely, extremely important. Periodic echo to assess for LV distension and for LV recovery in somebody on VA ECMO is extremely, extremely important. I would say do it at least every other day. Um, and then pulmonary artery catheter can also give you an idea. If you start seeing a rise in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, that tells you that the LV is starting to get distended. And so... Um, when you look at somebody on echo and their LV and LA are not distended, uh, the LV and LA don't show a lot of smoke. The aortic valve is opening at least every beat or every second beat. 
Um, the chest X-ray still looks clear. The SCVO2 still is good, greater than 65, and your CVP is still uh, acceptably low. Your PA, uh, if you have a PA catheter, your wedge pressure is still less than 12, and your arterial line shows a pulse pressure greater than 15. All of that, uh, uh, all of these are reassuring findings that you likely don't need to worry too much about LV unloading. On the other hand, if your echo starts showing that the LV LA is starting to get distended, you start to you start to see smoke or spontaneous contrast in the LV and the LA. The aortic valve is continuously closed. The X-ray starts to look a little bit more wet. Your central line starts to show you the CVP starts to sh go up more than 20. The PA catheter filling pressures start to go up or your pulse pressure is really low. All of these tell you that your LV is starting to get distended and this can compromise your chances of LV recovery. So LV venting should be immediately addressed when LV distension is present to achieve myocardial protection. This may improve the chances of weaning and uh, LV venting could be either non-invasive or invasive. Now, venting tends to be quite easy when you have put somebody on central VA ECMO because the chest is open. However, when you're looking at peripheral VA ECMO, you need to start looking at other options for uh, venting. So how can you vent or unload the LV? So interventions that are um, less invasive that can unload the LV or include reducing ECMO flows, starting the patient on inotropes or vasodilators if their pressure tolerates, increasing the PEEP will unload the LV, and starting to diurese the patient will definitely unload the LV. All of these are interventions that can help if somebody's starting to develop LV distension uh, on peripheral VA ECMO. Now, um, other more invasive uh, ways of achieving LV unloading include, uh, as we mentioned, having an impella in place, having a balloon pump in place, um, uh, things like uh, an atrial septostomy can be done. That can be done even percutaneously. Uh, you can obviously uh, vent through the uh, apex or through the mitral valve. It tends to be easier, obviously, if you have an open chest. Um, you can place an additional venous cannula or convert to central uh, extracorporeal life support. And so uh, these are all options uh, for venting or unloading the LV. Let's move on to the last uh, troubleshooting scenario, and that is differential oxygenation. So differential oxygenation, also known as north-south syndrome or the Harlequin syndrome, uh, only occurs with peripheral VA ECMO when the LV recovers, but still your pulmonary dysfunction or the pulmonary function is still impaired, or say the patient's going into ARDS, but his ventricle has recovered. You'll start seeing uh, what we call differential oxygenation. And so what happens with differential oxygenation is that the lower body receives oxygenated blood. Remember, your return cannula is going back to the femoral artery, and it's giving oxygenated blood uh, to the lower half of the body. Whereas if your LV is now recovered uh, and is pumping forward, then if the lungs are not functioning well, if you have somebody, for example, in ARDS, the blood coming back from the lungs will largely be uh, not well oxygenated. And so that left ventricle will be pumping forward deoxygenated blood. And so the upper half of the body will be receiving the deoxygenated blood that is coming from the heart, that is returning from the uh, lungs, uh, whereas the lower half of the body will receive will be receiving the oxygenated blood coming from the ECMO. And so that's not an ideal situation. You don't want somebody to have a deoxygenated blood pumped into their coronaries and into their uh, heads, uh, whereas their legs are oxygenated well. That's not an ideal situation, and we call that differential hypoxia. We only see it with peripheral VA ECMO when the heart recovers why the lungs have not recovered. And so how do you monitor for differential oxygenation? The important thing is that your blood gases and your saturation probe sh should be in the right arm. You should monitor saturations in the right side because that is the most distal uh, point where you can monitor away from the insertion of your arterial return cannula from ECMO. And that'll reflect the blood that the brain is seeing. And that'll reflect 
whatever is uh, being delivered through the carotids. And so you should monitor SpO2 and blood gases from the right arm if somebody is on peripheral VA ECMO. And uh, NEARS monitoring is extremely helpful in that situation as well. Monitoring the brain and the lower extremities using tissue saturation is also uh, very helpful. When do you suspect that you're starting to see differential oxygenation? If you start seeing a normal SpO2 in the, nor in the lower extremities, but desaturation of the right upper extremity. That's when you should start thinking, is, does this patient have differential oxygenation? How do you treat differential oxygenation? You can augment uh, venous drainage and increase pump speed so that you're basically giving more of an advantage to uh, the peripheral VA ECMO. You're basically trying to pump against force. You're trying to get the transition point uh, to be higher up in the aorta and uh, try to deliver as much as possible to the brain and the upper body. You can try to reduce left ventricular ejection. I think most of the times this is not usually very successful. I think what is extremely important in this uh, situation is optimizing mechanical ventilation. You should really optimize the PEEP, uh, optimize the inspired oxygen concentration. If your lung gas exchange is the issue, you should really try to optimize lung gas exchange as much as you can. And that'll definitely help you in situations of differential oxygenation. Now, if that does not work, uh, if optimizing ventilation does not work, then uh, you've got two options here. Either the heart is fully recovered now, and that's why you're getting that competitive flow. And if the heart is fully recovered, then you don't necessarily need the support of VA ECMO. You can com convert the patient to VV ECMO if the heart really looks that good. Um, however, if the heart is recovering, but not to the degree that you can switch to VV ECMO, but still it's enough to give you the competitive flow and enough to give you the differential oxygenation, then one thing you can do is switch the patient from VA ECMO to VAV ECMO. And what do I mean by VAV ECMO? Here, we're still draining uh, the femoral vein up into the IVC, and we're still returning to the femoral artery, but we've added another return cannula down from the IJ into the SVC and into the right atrium. And so here, what we've added is a return cannula to return oxygenated blood into the right atrium so that oxygenated blood will go into the lungs and then oxygenated blood will come back to the left side. And so this is one way of treating, uh, I guess I would call it the last ditch effort if all else fails, uh, would be basically to insert another return cannula, uh, uh, another uh, cannula into the right atrium through the IJ and call that the VAV setup. Um, and so that would be uh, probably a definitive way to treat uh, differential oxygenation. And so in summary, peripheral VA ECMO insertion requires image guidance for safe cannulation and use of distal perfusion cannulas is definitely, definitely encouraged. And you can assess it at the time of insertion um, using uh, tissue uh, saturation, uh, or you can do it as a salvage therapy. Peripheral VA ECMO uh, cannulation is associated with better outcomes compared to central VA ECMO, although we're sometimes forced to put somebody on central VA ECMO, that being sometimes uh, a better option in the OR. Uh, monitoring should focus on adequate oxygen delivery and early detection of complications. You should really be monitoring for membrane oxygenator failure. You should really be monitoring for differential hypoxia. Troubleshooting VA ECMO requires uh, a bit of a systematic approach. So thank you and uh, appreciate your attention and I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hijazi. Um Yes. One question about um, the north-south syndrome. When you say adjust drainage cannula or augment drainage cannula, what do you mean by that? So, 
what I mean by that is basically uh, drain as much as you can um, uh, so that you're basically able to pump forward as much as you can. And so with maximizing flow, what you will achieve is that you will basically force oxygenated blood up the aorta uh, so that you're able to move the transition point upwards so that you're able to provide oxygenated blood to the upper body. And so I don't understand, what I mean is drain as much as you can so that you can pump forward as much as you can. Um, now, obviously, you'll, you'll run into issues with chatter and drainage insufficiency if you go too, too high. But that is that is one way to do it. I would say optimizing ventilation is usually the go-to. Um, and if that doesn't work, we start discussing other more invasive options. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any other questions? You can stop recording there, uh, I think, Osama. <laughs>